From 1.8 million all the way up to 9 million, today we are talking about the top 15 most crowdfunded games in 2022. Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And usually on Monday we do a two back or not to back, but I currently am uh, probably cleaning up from Level Up Retreat and don't have time to do the two back or not to back, so we'll have one next week for you. But instead, we are going over the top 15 most crowdfunded games in 2022. I feel like I was going to say something else here. But now I don't remember what it was. Oh, oh, that's what it was. I remember what it was now. I was going to say that the first one is going to be Moonmaker's Titan with $1.8 million raised. And we will talk about this in a second. But put your guess down below before skipping to the end if you can figure out which one is the top most crowdfunded game in 2022 coming in at $9 million raised. Which is pretty high, by the way. That's like putting it in like the top three of tabletop in general, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. But either way, let's go ahead and start off with Moonraker's Titan coming in at number 15, 12,000 backers, $1.8 million raised, and this is a reprint campaign. In fact, another fun question, which I don't know the answer to myself, but guess down below, not just what you think is number one, but guess how many of these top 15 are in some way, shape, or form a reprint campaign of an existing title. I don't know for sure which one they are, but a reprint just means that they have a, a previous lineage of some sense, whatever it is. So in that sense, uh, we're going to go with, I'm going to guess that nine, mm, 10, I'm going to guess 10 of the 15 are in some way a reprint. I, I'm not even sure. I mean, I, I put together the list, but I don't remember how many there are. But in general, when you have these crowdfunding campaigns that raise a lot of money, they usually are reprints to some extent. King of Death Monster 1.5 is the second highest crowdfunding campaign of all time. And it's, you know, 1.5. They had the one before that. They have a Frosthaven, which was a spiritual successor to Gloomhaven, the most funded board game campaign of all time. In general, when you have a base to build off of, when you have that, you know, buy-in from people who believe or know your product's good because it's already been out there, that does help elevate crowdfunding to the next level. But again, 1.8 million for Moonraker's Titans. This is the big box version of Moonraker's, giving you three new expansions to Moonraker's, also a free solo mode for those who want to dive into that, and then a giant big box as well to combine all your content. I believe this one's actually delivering at this point. This one's delivering already, so people are getting the Moonraker. I think it's delivering. Where are the updates at? I believe it's delivering, I think. English Fulfillment Complete. Yeah, English Fulfillment Totally Complete over here. So we got that over there as far as uh, Moonraker's Titans uh, going out to people's doors and all that. But Moonraker's Titans is a deck building experience, a deck building experience that involves cooperating with the other players in order to achieve your goals, to achieve these contracts, and to be the first player to 10 points. Uh, the expansions in particular, again, with addition to the big box, the expansions added a, a specific goal to, I can't remember the names of the expansions, we had like Power Up, I think, and then we had Binding Ties, and then one other. Where are they? It's probably just on the side. Overload. Overload, Nomads, and Binding Tides. Binding Tides gave you more of an incentive to work together on your contracts. Overload gave you more card flexibility and fun stuff there. And then Nomads gave you a little small, small mini board with events as well to balance around, to navigate around there. So overall, that's going to be Moonraker's Titans, our number 15 over here, just bringing you more Moonraker's content to 13,000 backers and $1.8 million raised. And again, already delivered, which is not bad at all. Coming in at number 14, we have another space-themed game, Unsettled Board Game Plus New Content. This is another of the uh, reprints for sure, because this is the follow-up to Unsettled. Unsettled did a little over $1 million, if I recall correctly, the first time around. And Unsettled All New Content brought in $2 million raised over on Kickstarter from Orange Nebula. Orange Nebula is a fantastic company who have Vindication, which is a fantastic game. And Unsettled is just a fantastic game. And they have Spirit Fire coming up at some point, which I assume will be a fantastic game. But honestly, the downside of having two games of this level and quality means they can only really let me down. But Unsettled, absolutely fantastic experience. Highly recommend this game. I think it... I think it does so well as far as the the story it gives you, the narrative it gives you. It basically involves you navigating and exploring these individual planet little boxes that have different scenarios you're kind of going on. And in the case of this new Kickstarter, one of those scenarios is kind of dealing with your own ship being stranded in space with no power. And you're trying to navigate around, trying to accomplish goals through basically powers and abilities and manipulation of your resources while trying to slowly get more powers to be able to do a little bit more, to build these little uh, you know bases or outpost situations, to level up your own abilities, to find new cards in the out wilds, in the out wilds, in the uh, wildlands, in the outcasts, in the in the in the somewheres to find new stuff, basically. And so you're trying to work together with the other players. It plays well as a solo game, plays well at two, plays well at three. I find it's a little crowded at four, but overall unsettled. An absolutely fantastic game coming in at our number fourteen. Our number thirteen is going to be another reprint. I'm now wondering if my if my guess of 10 is too uh, too optimistic, maybe it's going to be like 12 or 13, but I'm sticking with my guess of 10. It is what it is. We have over here 
Final Girl Series 2. This is going to be from AJR from 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 Van Ryder Games. Uh, Final Girl Season 2 coming in at 2. Point, well 2.07 million dollars raised. And this is one that is building off of the success that Final Girl had. This is season 2, right? Series 2. Yep, Series 2 over here is building off the success of Final Girl that they already had, bringing you five new boxes, uh, very often themed based off of existing popular IP. So for example, Evil Morph over here is going to be based on Alien, and they have others as well. I think they had a Thing one or not. But this is basically Final Girl. It's the solo game of trying to roll dice and get abilities and try to use your Final Girl to survive the specific combination of location and boss that you're fighting against. One of the nice things about the game is that if you have a single box, you have a single location and a single boss. So if you have a single box, you have a single location and a single boss. The box and boss there confused me. But then past that, if you have, let's say, three boxes, then you have, you know, three different variations of three, three bosses and three locations. You can mix and match, giving you a ton more content. And there's a lot more than three boxes. The amount of variability to this game is not infinite, but definitely approaching a level that is, you're not going to be playing this game nearly enough to experience it. And that's in addition to the fact that there are also unique final girls. Although I do find the final girls don't influence your gameplay quite as much as far as how drastically it shifted up. Honestly, even just the way a scenario will play out different times based on the cards that are in play, that will have a bigger effect on how different the game feels every single time you play it. Overall, this is a well-loved solo game that the well-loved translated into $2 million raised the second time around. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, and someone correct me if I'm wrong here, but if I'm not mistaken, this is the highest funded solo game of all time. If I'm not mistaken, solo board game of all time, I think. I could be mistaken, but this is a solo only game. Uh, the only one, they, they had like the Batman one that did it in 2000. I think Final Girl is the highest funded solo board game. Coming in at number, we have 13 over here, number 12. We have 4, 15, 14, 12. Number 12 over here, Sleeping Gods, Distant Skies. And this is yet another game that's built off of the original Sleeping Gods over here. $2 million raised, $2.08 million, $2 million raised over on GameFound. This is Sleeping Gods Distance Guys from Red Raven Games, taking again the success of Sleeping Gods, which definitely can be played solo, but is not an exclusive solo game by any means. Uh, this is taking the success of Sleeping Gods that came in at rave reviews over on Board Game Geek from nearly everyone who played it. This is an ambitious adventure of, try of just. It's incredibly ambitious in terms of what you do. They have this giant book of stories and everything interacts in ways. So you wander around from a location and you wander across the mountain and you find this old woman. And now the next time you go to the village that you can reference the old woman. And so things change as you go through it. It almost feels like a video game translated into a board game, which will then of course cue the people who are like, well, I'll just play a video game if I wanna play a video game. Great, if that's your jam, that's your jam. But there's lots of people who enjoy that video game experience translated as a board game. I'm someone who plays a ton of board games and only a small amount of video games. I think every genre has its own medium and different reasons why it appeals to different people. And board games, even when app-based, definitely appeal to me in terms of the experience they give. And Distance Guys is building off of that as well. I believe they put out four narration as well on both the original. They did four narration and then backwards compatibility, compatibility to, it, to the uh, first edition as well, which I think you can already get. And Distance Guys, I don't know actually what... I I don't know when this one is arriving, but overall I'm definitely excited for it. I know they took feedback from the first one. I think there were lots of complaints around the uh, combat feeling a little grindy. I know they took that feedback and in some way they're adjusting it in some way. I don't know exactly, but either way, very excited for this one. That's going to be Sleeping Gods Distance Guys from Red Raven Games. Coming in at number 11, we have Uthia Resurrected. I'm definitely not. There's definitely not going to be even five. There's not going to be five unique properties. We'll see. But Uthia Resurrected from Steamforge Games coming in at 1.5 million pounds. 1.597 million pounds. So basically 1.6 million pounds over here. This is where it gave me some leeway on translations. I, I played around with the uh, currency conversion, but not necessarily at the time of the campaign. I think this is the number 11. Maybe it's the number 10. Maybe it's the number 12. I don't know exactly, but it's close enough. This is Uthia Resurrected from Steamforge Games. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's Uthia brought back to life. Uthia came out with the first edition. It was well-loved, well-appreciated. Kind of a, a Mage Knight-style game of exploration. Being very different than Mage Knight, but definitely giving you that kind of wandering around a map adventure vibes. You're wandering around a map, you're undercovering locations, you're going to different buildings, you're interacting, you're fighting with... I can't remember, do you fight with other players? I can't... I don't believe you fight with other players in this game, but it's been a while since I played, so I could be wrong. I think you only fight against... I think that's one of the differences. In Mage Knight, I believe in Mage Knight you could fight with other players, I have not played either of these games in so long, I might be messing this up over here. But you're definitely wandering around the map, and it's definitely, both of them are definitely uh, competitive games, that I believe there is a, solo, a, a cooperative mode, there's definitely a solo mode for this, I believe there was a cooperative mode, I could be mistaken on that. But you're wandering around the map, you're exploring, you're building up your character, you're getting more upgrades and abilities, you're trying to gather more gear in different ways, and then take down the various baddies as you can, and trying to accomplish more, th more than the others in the allotted time frame of the, uh, the quest that you're going on. There's different quests you can engage on, and Uthia delivered well, got a lot of reviews, was well 
loved, and then it, it launched over on GameFound, but unfortunately, the creators needed a certain amount to actually make, make it work, and they didn't receive that amount, and so they canceled the project. I think if I recall correctly, like 500,000 the first two days, and they're like, I'm sorry, we need 1.5 million, so we have to cancel the project. At that point, uh, Steamforge Games swooped in and took it over and brought it over to Kickstarter, where it raised 1.6 million pounds, a little over $2 million altogether, and that's Uthia Torment of Resurrection, our number 10. Coming in at number 9, we have Deep Rock Galactic, the board game. The first, we have the first unique property over here. This is the first non, I mean, technically it's based off an existing IP, but not in the board game space. So I'm going to give it points over here. In fact, we'll have at least, at least one more of those, but we'll see. Anyways, we have a Deep Rock Galactic, the board game coming from Mood Publishing. I believe this has delivered. If I'm not mistaken, this has already delivered. Uh, and I've seen generally positive reviews coming from it. This is one that looked very cool. It's one I didn't choose to back. In fact, from these over here, Moonmakers I have, Unsettled I have, or have coming, I should say. Final Girl I didn't. Uh, Sleeping Gods I have coming, Youthy I didn't, and then Deep Rock Galactic I have this one coming. That's not true, I don't know why I said that. I did not back this. I, I had shelf control and chose not to back this one even though I absolutely wanted it. The miniatures looked amazing. The gameplay looked solid. I remember that Mark Street from the Dice Tower definitely seemed to really much enjoy, really enjoy this one. And it's obviously he covers games in different ways, but he seemed to be more invested in what Deep Rock Galactic was. And overall, I saw a lot of good things about the game, and so I was definitely interested in it. But then also, it was like, you know, $200 for the all-in, and I was like, you know what, I can afford to wait for the next reprint. There'll be a reprint at some point, and I can get my hands on it then if I want to. Uh, but either way, this is Deep Rock Collective from Mood Publishing. It has since landed, and I've seen a lot of people really enjoying this one. I've seen it set up at conventions, I've seen it being played by people, and it does look like it's one that uh, people are enjoying, as you, I believe, cooperate, if I'm not mistaken, as you wander around the board trying to take out the various baddies, gather your various goodies, and try to ultimately win the scenario you're engaged in. I've seen overall, see what I over here, one of my all-time favorite previews, I had so much fun. In general, general, previewing games is always a tricky subject because you're always trying to cover things without necessarily giving an opinion, but I can tell you as someone who is a creator that very often when you have the opportunity to let those unique exceptions go, you often want to. I'm somebody that, like, there's only so many times you can say something like, one of my all-time favorite previews, and people generally understand that if you say that 17 times a year, people start losing faith in what you're saying, and Mark Street does not say it 17 times a year, so I took that at face value because of the excitement behind it. But either way, this Deep Rock Galactic over here, that was our number nine most funded board game of 2022. Coming in at number eight, we have Oathsworn, and this is a second edition, so it's not going to count for there, but coming in at $3.2 million. The original campaign, by the way, the original campaign would have already made this list at over $2 million raised, but that was, you know, not 2022. But in 2022, we have Oathsworn Into the Deepwood from Shadowborn Games. Shadowborn Games who just announced their uh, codename Project Mist, a area control uh, game themed in Avalon or whatnot coming in 2024. We'll find out more information at some point. Definitely excited for it. But in the meantime, Oswan Into the Deepwood is actually a absolutely killed it. I mean, this game has a 9.3 on Board Game Geek. I believe it has since dropped to a 9.1. That is normal over time. You have the initial hype and then some degree of adjustment around it. But it's still a well loved game with a lot of rankings behind it. A lot of people who are excited about it and love it and just want the game and just it, it's well loved. It's a well loved game by so many creators who have played the game, dove into it, and really enjoy it. Myself included. I definitely have the uh, extra stuff coming from here as well. This is basically just giving small tweaks. There are no major changes in this campaign. This is much more a second printing than anything else, uh, and then like tweaks or adjustments, whatever it is. But that's O Sworn into the Deep Board, an incredible narrative game across 20 scenarios, if I recall correctly. In which you're taking your your crew of well people, your crew of adventurers. I don't know what they're called exactly, but you have your crew of adventurers wandering through these 20 different like boss scenarios and fights. Each one having a story phase and then an actual encounter phase as well. So there's a lot of gameplay baked in here. You're looking at somewhere in the range of 60 hours of like, gameplay, somewhere around that number, depending on how fast or slow you go. They have an excellent companion system, so you can play with less than four players at the table. If you're playing, if you're playing it even solo, you could play with four full characters, or you could play with a single character and three companions. And the, and the way the companion system worked is it gave you the 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 power of the character without the complexity of the character so it really does allow you to have like your character and then the peripherals that you need to manage and work with it's a phenomenal game that i am eager to finish i am very excited for this one i like os1 a lot and well i want to i want to finish this campaign already from all the campaigns it's also it's accessible it's like it's like tenaris length in terms of like you know 20 missions as opposed to being like you know 100 missions this is the one that i do i can finish i plan on finishing and i will finish that is going to be oh swan into the deep wood from shadowborn games very excited about this one then we have over here coming in at number nine we have cthulhu death may die fear of the unknown from come on another reprint we're still only one out of the five i hopefully predicted for but basically Cthulhu: fear of the, fear of the unknown 3.4 million dollars raised from come on one of my favorite games of all time if not well 
no, it's one of my favorite games. It was, came in second last year. It was number two. Terraforming Mars still took the number one spot. But Cthulhu This May Die is just such a good time. I love this game, and I love everything that they did with Fear of the Unknown. They, well, I mean, I shouldn't say everything, because the first scenario of Cthulhu This May Die in season one, the episode one, is still to this day one of my favorite scenarios. I've played it like nine or ten times by now. Still one of my favorite scenarios. Still holds up. And the scenario, I only got to play a single scenario from Fear of the Unknown, and that single scenario was definitely not as good. But the change they made to the game, it was a good scenario, it just wasn't as good as that one. But the changes they made to the game, from the relics they have, from the additional monsters, overall just good changes to a game that I already loved. I'm very excited for this one. I cannot wait to get in my pledge and see what's going on with this. This is just, uh, this is one of the few games that are, this is one of those games that they're the reason I go all in because of games like this. Because I play a game like this and I love it and I adore it. And then I go all in because of the fact that I, I, I've played all of this. So I have a handful of games in my collection where I can actually justify having the all in. Most of the time I'm like, great, Tenerous Adventures, I love you. Do I need all of you? Not on the chance. Massive Darkness, you're incredible. Have I played nearly what you have? Not even close to it. But games like Zombicide Black Play, games like Through Death May Die, those are the games that really justify their existence. Marvel United, dear, dear lord, I've played so much of that. But either way... This one over here, Cthulhu, Fear of the, Cthulhu Death May Die, Fear of the Unknown, an incredible experience that I highly, highly recommend, and this is like, I, I can't imagine you can late pledge this one, but this is the second edition, coming at 3.4, our number 9. Our number 8 is going to be Castle of the Burgundy Special Edition, another definite reprint here, 2.9 million euro over here, which I think translates, it translates into more than 3.4, at least based on conversion, 22,000 backers, and oh boy, this game is popular. And this game has just started to deliver as well, you're starting to see lots of unboxings, lots of reboxings, because as much as Awakened Realms did right, they also did some things wrong. Also, disclaimer, by the way, I probably should say this. Disclaimer that I do work for GameFound. Take that into account. Of course, I'm remembering to give the disclaimer when I'm being critical. But either way, Castle Burgundy Special Edition, an amazing experience. Uh, the best version of the game that I've seen to date uh, in terms of the, the, the general look of the components. The Not the accessibility. The accessibility is worse. But just the premium feel of the game you have as you play through this. It is a delight. It is a lot of fun. People are excited about it. People want in on this. Uh, this is one that was set up and being played at Origins. And and the table is non-stop rotating with people who just wanted to get in. People who are standing around watching it being played. There's such a table presence to this game that is one of the best games of all time on Board Game Geek. It's been around for a long time. I can't remember. Is it a 2010 title? 2008? 2012. It's not that old, comparatively speaking, but it's Stefan Feld's best title, my favorite title from his. It was in my, it was my number two of all time last year, not this past year, but the year before that. I think it was my number 17 this past year, and it may have gone up because I have played this game over 50 times this year. I played the deluxe version maybe four or five times, but I played this game over 50 times this year. It is a great, great Castle Burgundy, and this is this is gives you the Vineyards expansion as well, so it gives you new content. It gives you the ability to, for all the players to have the same player board because of the way those player boards overlap overall an incredible production and one that I I'd say I'm excited to see but I already have so one that maybe you're excited to see maybe your copy is currently arriving because I believe I've seen copies starting to be delivered to backers around here and there like they're starting to show up so you may be in the camp of someone who has it already or you may be in the camp of someone who has not but this is Castle Burgundy 22,000 backers and around three and a half million dollars raised then coming in at number I can never keep track seven seven I think we're at What's that? What, I cannot. 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. I think Cthulhu is number 8. This is number 7. So coming in at number 6, we have Slay the Spire of the Board Game. I was wrong, Cthulhu. Sorry about that. Slay the Spire of the Board Game coming in at $3.9 million raised from Contention Games. This is number 2. This is number 2 from those uh, unique titles that don't have previous history. So Slay the Spire over here. And obviously, again, based on an IP. So, so far, the two that are not reprints are based on video games that have their own following. But Slay the Spire over here, coming to Infectention Games, who previously did, like, Age of Imperium. They did a small game. No, not Age of Imperium. Darn it. They, age, no, it's not Age of Imperium. It's just called Imperium, right? I think, maybe. Either way, Slay the Spire, based on the video game and a game that's going to run you around $100 for a fantastic game, genuinely fantastic, but then there are many people who are like, why don't I just pay $15 for the video game and play that? Seems like it's easier, right? And the answer is, you're not wrong, and, and I've had to recommend one or the other, the board game or the video game, I would definitely recommend the video game. I think that I mentioned already in this game, in this, in this video that I don't play that many video games, and that's true. But the one I do play a lot of, or a decent amount of, is Slay the Spire. I think it's a great game that really holds up. I can strongly recommend it. I think it's just so, so much fun and an overall good time, and it's just incredible. And I also still recommend the board game, although you have to be someone who wants to play a board game. You have to be somebody who looks at video games and says, often I'd rather just be playing a board game. This gave me the video game feel, but it does so with... I think that 
Setup and maintenance wasn't really a problem, meaning in terms of dealing with the game flow of Slay the Spire, they actually did a really good job making it accessible. The area with Slay the Spire, the video game is just better than the board game every single time, is when I lose a run of Slay the Spire, the, the video game, I just hit reset and start again. When I lose a run of the board game, there's setup and tear down and removing the cards from the decks and re-putting things back the way they are. That does add a degree of tediousness to the experience that when I finish playing, often I'm just going to pack it up and put it away so I can dive into it next time, as opposed to immediately resetting and diving back in. So that is going to be the one thing I'll be critical of. But past that, they did a great job capturing the experience. Granted, it is at a, a more expensive price point than the video game, and also I hear noises from that direction, which means I may have a child coming downstairs. We'll deal with that if it happens. But in the meantime, that's Slay the Spire of the Board game, our number six most funded game of 2022. Our number five most fun the game of 2022 is Casting Shadows. So we're at three now. We are at three. And this one is not based on a video game. Give me a second while I say hi to my child. Hello, Rafiki. How's it going? You want to say hi to everyone? Hi, everyone. Well, well, everyone's in here. That's the camera. You have to say hi. Hi. Okay, cool. Can I finish filming? Bye. Bye, bye, bye. The one go see the next one, Army Man. Okay, can we watch Army Man in like five minutes? Yeah? Yeah, I want to watch Lego. I want to watch Lego on me. Lego on minutes in five minutes, okay? okay? Awesome. Thank you, bud. I'll see you. Oh, I like that game. Five minutes. Five minutes. Upstairs. Thank you. I love you. And the Great Wall and Mulan. And the Great Wall China and Mulan. That's okay. And you see you guys and Mulan. Sounds good. I forgot the kids come home early today. Sorry about that. Anyways, uh, the other five, I think, five, four, five, five. Casting Shadows. Casting Shadows, 36,000 backers, $4 million raised, and the first totally unique game from Unstable Games over here. Uh, this one did tremendously well, had a lot of appeal. I've gotten it. I spent way more money on it than I ever should have. My kids got a lot of plushies out there, so it's cool. And these things, are they? These things are so cool. They really are. They're incredibly cool. But at the end of the day, it's a game I haven't played yet. It's a game because I got it. I didn't get it for the game. I paid like $400 for this, which was an insane amount. It's crazy. It's the reason I've stopped backing so many crafting campaigns. Uh, but again, uh, most of it was for plushies. Most of the expenses this was for plushies that I gave my kids. I, I paced out the gifts one at a time. I'm a, I'm a decent dad. I'm just I'm just terrible at budgeting. But either way, this is Casting Shadows. $4 million raised and a game that I've seen. The ratings in this are okay. It's like a 6.8 or 6.7, something like that. I'm working geek. Ratings do not seem to be overly impressed. Now, that doesn't scare me because I got this to play not for the sake of me playing a game, but to play with my kids. And for example, what's the last one? They had a Here to Slay. Here to Slay, my kids love that game. And I enjoy playing it with them. I have a genuinely fun time playing Here to Slay with my kids. So if Casting Shadows can even give me that kind of experience, that's good enough for me. Now I just need to read the rules and actually play this because I have not done so yet. That's going to be Casting Shadows, our number five. Our number four is going to be Heroes of Might and Magic 3, the board game. This counts, right? This is our fourth one. This is number four. Yeah, this is number four. That awkward cut was just the power going out and me having to restart my computer and everything. So we're back now. Our number four. Number four is going to be Heroes of Might and Magic 3, the board game. 3.8 million euro raised, which again is over. Again, I did the conversions. It all works out. This is our number four most funded board game of 2022. And again, based on a video game. The good news is this brings us to, I believe, number four. I've had four. We've had three video games and one non-video game as our unique non-reprint situation. So we have three more after this. And the question is, will I be right on that five or not? But here's, either way, Heroes of Might and Magic 3, the board game. This is based on the video game. Even though it's called 3, it's 3, the video game, not 3, the board game, if that makes sense. And this is giving you that kind of, again, similar to Euthia, that sense of exploration, that sense of adventure, that Mage Knight kind of style of wandering around, having locations, has a very similar look and feel to it. All these three games, Euthia, Heroes of Might and Magic, and Mage Knight, all tapping into that same style of what's happening here, but with very different implementations past that as far as how they operate. This one also had a solo mode, also had a campaign mode, I believe, I'm going by recollection over here. This one had a separate kind of side puzzle where you'd have like, you're wandering around the board, you could fight other players in this one, you'd have a separate side puzzle battlefield that you'd move on to to engage with these encounters and these monsters and all these things. Let's see if I could find that that board over here somewhere. Here we go. Here's the, like, the battle mat. You can face battle off on the other. That's an interesting mechanic in of itself. Very intrigued with this one. Miniatures looked amazing from Arkham Games, Arkham Studio. Arkham Games? Arkham Studio. Arkham Studio over here. And that's Heroes of Might, Heroes 3 of, Heroes of Might and Magic 3, the board game. 27,000 people back this one for 3.8 million euro. Our number three is going to be Elden Ring, the board game. Again, a unique property, but again, based in a video game. So we have 
five so far, and we hit five at the end of it, and then four of them based on video games. Video games to board games are definitely happening. I mean, this is definitely a thing now. We have four of the top top 15 most funded board games of 2022 are video games, effectively translated. So we're definitely seeing that, and we're going to see even more of that in 2023, I have to imagine. I, of course, will be doing a recap like this in 2023 at some point, maybe earlier in the year. This does feel a little overdue, but hey, I didn't do one yet, so let's go ahead and do this. Elden Ring, the board game from Steamforge Games, 13,896 backers, raising 3.2 million pounds, and the pounds are more than the euros. It works out. It's like around $4 million-ish, something like that. But either way, Elden Ring the board game, bringing you the tarnish to your tabletop. This is one I have had the chance of playing. They did fly me in, so full disclaimer transparency, they did fly me in for the um, press event around Elden Ring, but I had a chance to play this one. It, I'm not sure if it's my favorite Elden Ring game, my favorite Steamforce game or not, because I really do like, uh, what's it called? In fact, do I see this over here? It's not just my favorite Steamforce title. I believe it's my favorite Steamforce game title so far. <laughs> Awkward. Uh, I really like Resident Evil. That's the tricky part. So I think, and I don't know if I just didn't remember that, but I'm also not sure. It's not that I think Resident Evil is be better than Elden Ring. I really enjoyed the tactical combat of Elden Ring as I played through this one, but I also really enjoyed Resident Evil. I'm not sure which, which game from Steamforge is my favorite, but I really enjoyed this tactical puzzle here. It really felt like you were trying to pace out how to take down the enemies. There's a decent amount of card play. I didn't even engage with the way you're leveling up your tarnish across the multiple scenarios. I was definitely very intrigued by what this game does and how it does it, and I'm very excited. Like They're going to have multiple Kickstarter campaigns. They said that straight up. We're going to have multiple campaigns for this game. We're going to have the first one, and then we'll have the second, and the reprint, and all these things, and more content. There's a lot of content to explore in this world and there's going to be a lot of money raised for this one i'm very i'm very excited for this to deliver and for people to see if they enjoy it or not i know in general steamforge games has had mixed reviews as far as different games as far as which people like them or not like dark souls wasn't as much for me it was fine but resident evil really enjoy uh, horizon zero dawn i enjoy but i think there's too much boxes there for me to actually keep on hold on to that one uh Barton was good had a little bit of grind elden ring and, and and resident evil i think are my favorite ones from what they have i feel like i'm missing one What's the Steamforge? Oh, Monster Hunter World. Monster Hunter World I really enjoy. So overall, Steamforge games are definitely some mixed experiences and some things I'm critical of. Like, I don't love the video game art, but I understand they're working with their hand tied behind the back on that one. Overall, definitely very excited for Elden Ring with $4 million raised. This is our third most funded game of 2022. Our second most funded game of 2022 is going to be Tainted, Gale, Tainted Grail Kings of Rune, and this is another reprint campaign. Based off the original Tainted Grail, this is being your Tainted Grail Kings of Rune, as well as more Tainted Grail, with 6.2, no, no, that's the wrong, wrong button over there, $6.2 million raised so far, but it was 4.4 when the campaign ended. GameFound does this thing where it's an opt-in thing, but on GameFound, if the creator sets it, then you'll see the total funding as opposed to the campaign funding. So now it's 6.8, but we have to compare apples to apples here. $4.4 million raised on Tainted Grail Kings of Rune over here. Uh, this is bringing you the narrative adventures of wandering off into Avalon, continuing the story, or I think it's a pre-story. Is it a pre-story Tainted Grail? Now I can't remember. Because I never played Tainted Grail properly. I've, d I've played, like, the first two scenarios, or first, like, I don't know, not two scenarios, sessions, whatever it is, of Tainted Grail. But I haven't played Kings of Rune. I dove into the first two as well. But I don't remember if it's a precursor or not. Either way, Tainted Grail. They made changes and tweaks to the, uh, to the to some of the elements of the gameplay. And this is one where people who liked the game liked it even more. People had a chance to play this one. They changed the gameplay nail is what I was hoping to see. Solo players are going to be extremely pleased with this one. I like Tainted Grail from what I've seen of it. And I'm eager to dive back into it more to see what this adventure or world does. As far as the uh, the menus are trying to uh, activate. Or as far as the light posts and navigating around the world. Has a lot of character building. A lot of skill tests. A lot of chaining cars together. Overall, very much enjoyed this one. But I definitely need to see more of it to see where it ends up for me. But Tainted Grail is going to be our second most funded title of 2022. Which brings us to our most funded title, which is now time to see if you, first of all, by the way, I will say apparently I was right. Granted, I kind of have the peripheral knowledge that I put these together, so I got, I got an excuse there, a pass, so, so to speak. Not a pass, a, I don't get any kind of points at all is what I'm saying. But either way, uh, I was right that there are only five campaigns here that were unique titles. The other ten were all reprints of some sort, and from those five, four of them were video game IPs, which almost makes Casting Shadows unique and war noteworthy in its own right. But if you can remember, if you can predict at this point what the, what the highest funded campaign of 2022 was, coming in at $9 million raised, keep in mind that the second highest was $4.4 million, and the highest was double the second highest. The highest campaign of 2022 was double the second highest, and that's Marvel Zombies at $9 million raised from Command Games. Marvel Zombies, a game that brought in a ton of money and then brought like another $18 million in in shipping costs as well. 
Either way, this is Marvel Zombies. Marvel Zombies, which is a game that I really enjoyed and I'm looking forward to having my final pledge deliver. I like the Zombicide system, so sue me. I do. I enjoy it. I like Undead or Alive. I like Black Plague. And I like uh, uh, Green Horde. And I like Marvel Zombies as well. I'm eager to dive into this one. I'm eager to see White Death as well. That one had like a last few days comeback. Fascinating story. Though. That like looked like it was barely going to cross 2 million and then crossed 4 in the end or 3.8. It did well. It did well. I don't remember exactly what it was. It did well. Either way, Marvel Zombies giving you a ton of stuff, including a giant Galactus who finally arrived by the way my galactus arrived just the other day but this is this is marvel zombies uh, bringing you so much content for marvel zombies from all tons of fantastic four to to x-men to i think spider-man if i recall correctly a whole bunch of them I mean, spider-man's in the core box so yes i guess so a ton of things over here this uh 615 dollar devourer pledge bringing you all this stuff and a ton of stuff there were there were stretch goals or unlocks there's giant man there's dr doom there's ghost rider hawkeye spider woman says uh, shang chi there's tons and tons of daily reveals of stretch goals of optional buys of giant galactuses that you totally don't need and should not get in any way and I said that during the campaign I'm not just saying that now I said during the campaign you should not get it I can justify it because like I can do a video around it and like show it on my shelf in the background because like yeah I have space for that either way I can sort of justify it but it totally totally should not get to Galactus it's insane but either way that is going to be Marvel Zombies, the most funded campaign of 2022, doubling the next highest campaign, which is absolutely insane to me. That means 4.4 million for Grail, 9 million for Marvel Zombies, absolutely insane. I'm very curious if we'll see something like that for 2023. 2023 has had a lot of good campaigns so far. I think we're going to go ahead and wrap this up right about now, which means 2023 has had a lot of good campaigns so far, and different ones that I can predict will be in the 2023 recap, but I won't go into them now. I'll leave them alone. I will say at least one of them is definitely a video game, though. But past that, I don't know if we'll have any that hit 9 million. 9 million is a noteworthy number. It's very hard to get those campaigns, and I don't know what will be in the 2023 recap when, when everything's said, said and done. There's a bunch of things that will cross the, like, you know, the 4 million mark. I can think of already a handful offhand, but 9 million is just a specifically high number. It's high. It's high. Those things happen, but they happen infrequently, not frequently. That's the nature of infrequently. I'm glad we covered that. In any case, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I apologize for the various interruptions this video between my son, who I'm, I think, four minutes late on now. I need to go take care of him. Uh, but past that, also the power going out and those things, and that's always fun in games. But in the meantime, these are the most fun games of 2022. I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. And I hope you have a good one. dark humor warning. How did the kid cross the road? He didn't have a seatbelt on.